Section 16 of Madame de Stahl by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11. Madame de Stahl and August Schlegel at Rome, Part 1. Madame de Stahl sought to solace her grief for her father's death by writing The Private Life of Necker, a short sketch intended to serve as preface to a volume of his fragmentary writings. Constant spoke very feelingly of this sketch and pronounced it to be a revelation of all that was best in the writer's head and heart. He said that all her gifts of mind and feeling were here devoted to express and adorn a single sentiment, one for which she claimed the sympathy of the world. This is all quite true, but it is natural that the sketch should affect us less than it did Madame de Stahl's contemporaries. Necker was a good and intelligent man. He had varied talents of no common order and an incorruptibility of character which would be rare, given the circumstances in any age, and by his admirers was supposed to be especially so in his but joined to all these qualities in him were just the foibles which spoil an image for posterity he had a profound compassion for what he considered the hardships of his lot it is touching to read the way so simple loving and yet ingenuous in which madame de stal records such facts as the following it was painful to him to be old his figure which had grown very stout and made movement irksome to him gave him a feeling of shyness that prevented his going into society he hardly ever got into a carriage when anybody was looking at him and he did not walk where he could be seen in a word his imagination loved grace and youth and he would say to me sometimes i do not know why i am humiliated by the infirmities of age but i feel that it is so and it was thanks to this sentiment that he was loved like a young man for the rest the sketch is one long impassioned elegy in prose one is astonished at the sudden creative force of expression in it it is graphic by mere power of words without any help from metaphor it was not in madame de stahl's nature to mourn in solitude and we have bonstetin's authority for the fact that the summer of 1804 was one of the most delightful which he had ever passed at the chateau. Schlegel, Constant, Sismondi were all there, as well as Bonstetton himself and Madame Necker de Saussure, now more than ever devoted to her cousin. Madame de Stahl had also a new visitor, Müller, the historian, whose learning was stupendous and who wrangled from morning till night on subjects of amazing erudition with schlegel the mistress of the house although far from being the equal of the two combatants in learning sometimes rushed between them with her fiery eloquence like an angel with a flaming sword but most of the society was reduced to silence sismondi felt a perfect ignoramus and talked plaintively to Bonstetten of going to Germany, there to drink in facts and theories at the source of the new intellect. In short, the German revival was beginning, and Madame de Stahl, in bringing August Schlegel to Switzerland, had broken a large piece off the mountain of learning, like somebody in the fairy tale, who carried away a slice from the island of jewels. In October 1804, Madame de Stahl started with Schlegel and her three children for Italy, and it is to this journey that the world owes Corinne. It is said that Schlegel first taught Madame de Stahl to appreciate art, that is, painting, sculpture, and architecture. For music she had always had a passion, and both sang and played agreeably but plastic beauty had as yet been a sealed book to her, and she had not even any great appreciation of scenery. A spontaneous feeling for all these she perhaps never acquired. Sainte Beuve indeed complains that the spot on Mycenaeum where she places Corinne in one occasion was the least picturesque of many beautiful points of view. Nevertheless, Italy revived her, she found hope and thought and voice anew beneath that magic sky. 
there was nothing but the still abiding sense of loss to mar the pleasure of her visit the diplomatic agents of napoleon abstained from interference with her and joseph had given her letters introducing her to all the best society in rome unlike her own corinne however she found it very uninteresting and wrote complainingly to bonstetten that humboldt was her most congenial companion the roman princes she found extremely dull and preferred the cardinals as being more cultivated or more probably more men of the world for the rest she was received with the liveliest respect and even enthusiasm and made a member of the arcadian academy and had endless sonnets written upon her unfortunately her dix années d'exil does not speak of this italian journey and so for the impression she received one has to return to corinne where of course everything reappears more or less transfigured one would have liked to know the genesis of that work on what occasion it took root and how it grew in madame de stal's mind how much did she really know of that poor lampooned insulted and squint-eyed corilla who was the origin of her enchanting sibyl how far below the surface did she really see of that strange roman world so cosmopolitan so chaotic after the french invasion so thrilled with fugitive novel ideas so steeped in time-worn apathy it would be delightful to know what was the impression which madame de stal herself produced in the few salons where a little culture prevailed and what was the true notion concerning her in that motley and decaying society of belated arcadians exhausted chichisbei and abatini lapsed forever from the genial circles where their youth had passed in gossiping and sonneteering hers must have seemed a curious and forcible figure among all those frivolous survivals and great and strange mad and merry as were the many foreigners who found their way at various times to rome probably no more striking couple ever appeared there than madame de stal and august schlegel as soon as she returned to switzerland she began corinne at coppe some of her old circle immediately gathered round her again madame necker de saussure of course and madame rillier hubert schlegel constant and sismondi assembled to enjoy her society once more the private theatricals in which she delighted were again resumed and such tragedies as zaire and phaedre performed as well as slight comedies composed by the chatelaine herself madame de stal was fond of acting and although she had no special talent her imposing presence and the earnestness with which she played made her performance a pleasing one at any rate to her admirers when corinne was drawing to an end its authoress could no longer resist her old and recurring temptation to return to france she went first to auxerre then profiting by the indulgence of fouche who when it was possible and politic always shut one eye she accepted an invitation to acosta a property near moulin belonging to madame de castellane some of her old friends ventured there to visit her and in peace and reviving hope she completed corinne it was no sooner published than it was hailed with universal applause all this success annoyed napoleon possibly because it revealed in his enemy greater powers than he had hitherto suspected hence a greater influence with all enlightened minds according to some an article which appeared in the moniteur attacking corinne was written by the imperial hand and this first sign of ire was followed by a new decree of banishment which sent madame de stal back to coppet there a few new figures came to join the usual set among them prince august of prussia who straightway fell a victim to madame recamier for a few weeks this love affair introduced a new element of romantic yet very human interest into the intensely intellectual life of coppet the prince wished madame recamier to marry him and for a short time either dazzled by the prospect of such splendour or really attracted by her royal wooer she hesitated 
but such a step would have involved a divorce from M. Recamier. He was old, he had lately lost his fortune, he had always been good to her, and Juliette made up her mind that it would be too unkind to leave him. Some other scenes, not altogether literary, were passing just then in the chateau. The relations between Madame de Stal and Constant, of late much strained, had now become constantly stormy. Sismundi, some years later, in writing to the Countess of Albany, referred to them as really distressing, and apparently Madame Ricamier was in the flattering but uncomfortable position of having to listen to, and, as well as she could, soothe both parties. Constant would have married Madame de Stal, but she desired a secret marriage, and he would only hear of an open one. It was only in 1808 he finally put an end to his perplexities by marrying Charlotte von Hardenberg. He carefully avoided telling Madame de Stal of his intention beforehand, being still too much under her influence to bear her criticisms and possible reproaches with equanimity. About November 1807, Madame de Stal had returned again to Germany, accompanied by two of her children, by Constant, Sismundi, and Schlegel. From Munich she wrote one of her characteristic letters to Madame Recamier. I have spent five days here, and I leave for Vienna in an hour. There I shall be thirty leagues farther from you, and from all who are dear to me. All society here has received me in a charming manner, and has spoken of my beautiful friend with admiration. You have an aerial reputation which nothing common can touch. The bracelet you gave me, this bracelet contained Madame Recamier's portrait, has caused my hand to be kissed rather oftener, and I send you all the homage which I receive. In another she significantly remarks, The Prince de Ligne is really amiable and good above all things. He has the manners of Monsieur de Narbonne and a heart. It is a pity he is old, but all that generation fill me with an invincible tenderness. This is one of her touching allusions to her father, of whom all good grey heads reminded her. But the Prince de Ligne and Necker were two very different people. The former was the ideal of un grand seigneur, clever, brave, handsome, all in a supreme degree, the descendant of a chivalrous race, and as gallant and noble himself as any of them. He was extremely witty, and quickly achieved the conquest of the Empress Catherine when he was sent on a mission to Russia in 1782. He followed in her suite through the Crimea on the occasion of her famous journey there with Joseph II, and his amusing account of this expedition is one of his claims to literary reputation. The last years of his brilliant life were embittered by the loss of his property, consequent on the French invasion of Belgium, and by the death in battle of his eldest and best beloved son. Madame de Stal probably enjoyed his society all the more that the Viennese gentlemen appeared to her singularly uninteresting. She complained of them in her letters to the Grand Duchess of Weimar, and also to Madame Recamier, and declared that she felt the need of a summer at Coppet to indemnify her from the frivolous monotony of the Austrian capital. She seems to have been in an unusually depressed state of mind, and recurred perpetually to the hardships of exile. In April 1808, shortly before starting again for Weimar, she addressed a letter to her former friend, the ungrateful Talleyrand, begging him to interest himself for the payment of the two millions left by her father in the French treasury. She alluded sadly and at some length to all her sufferings again in this letter, and reminded him that he wrote thirteen years previously to her from America, if I must remain even one year longer here, I shall die. One is not much surprised to divine from subsequent circumstances that this appeal produced no effect. Amiable and even pathetic as it was, Talleyrand was not the man to be moved by it, like Napoleon, to whom he perhaps showed it, 
he would be likely to think that madame de stael's exile was singularly mitigated it is one thing to be proscribed and banished not only from one's own country but from friends and fortune to wander as so many illustrious refugees have done a lonely stranger in a foreign land not daring to invoke the protection of any authority and constantly eking out a miserable existence by teaching or worse it is another thing to be wealthy influential admired to be the guest of sovereigns and the honoured friend of the greatest minds in europe to be surrounded with sympathy and followed at every step by the homage of a brilliant and cultured crowd such was the existence of madame de stal her sorrows were great because her fiery temperament rebelled against her grief at the same time that her great intellect fed it with lofty and lyric thoughts but her sorrows were of the affections exclusively she never felt the sting of the world's scorn nor knew the bitter days and sleepless nights of poverty if she ever ate her bread with tears they were not those saltest tears of all which are wrung from burning eyes of unachieved hopes and frustrated endeavour every field of social and intellectual activity was open to her except the salon of paris and those were very different under the blight of napoleonic bureaucracy from what they had been even during the mingled vulgarity and ferment of the directory End of section sixteen section seventeen of madame de stal by bella duffy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven madame de stal and august schlegel at rome part two she returned to weimar and had a touching meeting with the grand duchess whose recent troubles and the courage she displayed under them had not only endeared her to her subjects and her friends but had won the applause of the world on her way thither she presumably delayed a short while in berlin and it must have been to that period that tickner refers when relating a very amusing anecdote in his life and letters she asked fichte to give her in a quarter of an hour a summarized idea of his famous ego professing to be as she doubtless was entirely in the dark about it fichte's consternation may be imagined for he had been all his life developing his system and intended it to comprehend the universe moreover he spoke very bad french and even if madame de stal were momentarily silent in speech we may fancy how voluble she looked and how nervous the presence of her imminent rapid speech must have made the philosopher however he made up his mind to the attempt and began in a very few moments madame de stal burst out ah that is enough i understand perfectly your system is illustrated by a story in munchausen's travels fichte's expression at this announcement was a study but the lady went on he arrived once on the banks of a wide river where there was neither bridge nor ferry neither boat nor raft and at first he was in despair but an idea struck him and taking hold of his own sleeve he jumped himself over to the other side now monsieur fichte is not this exactly what you have done with your ego this speech charmed everybody except fichte himself who never forgave madame de stal or at least so tickner's informant said and it is easy to believe him during the remainder of eighteen o eight and the whole of eighteen o nine and eighteen ten madame de stal remained alternately at coppet and geneva working steadily at the allemagne it was only about this time that she acquired habits of sustained occupation her father had entertained so strong and singular an objection to seeing her engaged in writing that rather than pain him she used to scribble at odd hours and in casual positions sometimes for instance standing by the chimney-piece in this way she was able to hide her work as soon as he appeared and thus spare him the annoyance of supposing that he had interrupted her she talked so continually 
that it was a marvel how she ever wrote at all, and her friends used often to wonder where and how she planned her works. But the truth seems to have been that they sprang full-grown from her brain, after having been unconsciously developed there by perpetual discussion. During the years above mentioned, society at Coppe, although normally composed as of old by Schlegel, Sismondi, Constant for a time, Madame Recamier and Bonstetin, was varied once more by new and interesting visitors. Among these were Madame Lebrun, who not only painted a portrait of Madame de Stal, but noted many things which now afford pleasant glimpses of the life at the chateau. Of course, like everybody else who sojourned as a guest at Coppet, she fell under the spell of the hostess. Byron himself some years later recorded how much more charming Madame de Stal was in her own house than out of it, and she seems to have possessed the art of dispensing her hospitality, which was royal, with as much grace as cordiality. Among the new figures in these years at Coppe was Werner and Oehlenschläger. Both were poets and cursed with the irritability of the genus, so that their mutual exasperation was great, and Madame de Stal had some trouble to keep the peace between them. Sismondi, in one of his letters, described Werner as a man of many intellectual gifts, who considered himself the apostle of love, and bound to preach it in his wanderings through the world. Occasionally his utterances were a little puzzling to sober-minded people who were too much taken aback by his mystical mixtures of passion, sentiment, and piety to be always ready with an answer. Werner had had a Sturm und Drang period of extreme dissipation, had taken to Freemasonry, and imbibed, apparently, some of the ideas of the Illuminati, and besides his mysticism and religion inclined to socialism and politics. After all, this vagueness of thought joined to a highly impressionable and very vivid temperament, it is not surprising to learn that he eventually became a Roman Catholic priest and rose to great renown as a preacher. Erlenschläger has left a spiteful picture of Werner with his nose full of snuff, discussing his esoteric doctrines in an execrable patois which was intended for French. Both poets, however, united in admiring and praising, almost worshipping, Madame de Stal, and she on her side seems to have cared little for any peculiarity in their habits as long as there was originality in their characters. It was during this visit of the two poets at Coppe that Karl Ritter appeared for a short time on the scene. He enjoyed a great reputation in Germany, being considered as the inventor of the science of comparative geography. He was also a gentle, earnest man, and became extremely religious in his old age. He records an animated, indeed perfervid and amazingly eloquent speech pronounced before him by Madame de Stal in favor of the metaphysical origin of religion, and an answer to Sismondi, who maintained that its basis should be reasoned morality. Madame de Stal declared that religion was the condition of virtue, and that without it there could be no higher life, by which she meant no communion with God. In support of this thesis, she displayed the most surprising power both of analysis and illustration, while her logic, appearing to Ritter unanswerable, caused the discussion, as he avers, to be an epoch in his intellectual life. This new interest of Madame de Stal in such questions was largely due to the ever-growing influence of Madame de Crudinet, now irrevocably regenerate and rapidly rising to fame as a priestess and prophetess while leading a life of the utmost asceticism. She had been in Coppe again and had left there the trail of her sacerdotal tendencies. Poor Bonstetin, daily growing younger in mind and heart, was comically disgusted at the change which was coming over the intellectual life at the chateau. The confusion of dogmas prevailing could not console him for the fact of there being any dogmas at all. Between Catholics, Burmists, 
Martinists and mystics, he appeared at times to be quite worn out, and attributed the whole revolution to the influence of his pet aversion, Schlegel. How he made this out is not very clear, for the theological spirit was as cosmopolitan in its representatives as varied in its forms. Mathieu de Montmorency was a Catholic, somebody else a quietist, a third an illuminist, while rationalism was left to the doubtful prowess of Baron Vogt, who was reported by Bonstetten to be as gyratory in his opinions as a weathercock. We now approach an event in Madame de Stal's life, so well known and so often recounted, that it will not be necessary to relate it again in detail. This was the suppression of her Alemagne, Napoleon's crowning act of meanness, and a deed which obtained for Madame de Stal the entire and unquestioning sympathy of every enlightened mind and generous heart. Madame de Stal determined, after some hesitation, to publish the work in Paris, after submitting it in the first instance to the approval of the imperial censors. Why she took this unfortunate resolution it is difficult to conceive, for she had been plentifully illuminated with regard to Napoleon's spite, and even if all her penetration did not enable her to foresee the full lengths to which this would carry him, she might, one would think, have guessed that the censors in Paris would judge her work with the utmost severity. However this may be, she took up her abode near Blois for the sake of correcting the proofs as they issued from the press. She had, before leaving Coppet, caused her passports to be made out for America, in which country she had property, and whither, for the sake of her children, she said she was gradually making up her mind to go. One cannot imagine Madame de Stal in the New World such as it was in those days, and as she entertained the project for a long while, put it off from month to month, and finally abandoned it altogether. It is more than probable that she never liked it sufficiently to have resolved upon it seriously. At Blois, she established herself at the famous Chateau de Chaumont-sur-Loire, haunted by such various memories as the Cardinal d'Amboise, Diane de Poitiers, Catherine de Medici, and Nostradamus. But the owner of the house, shortly returning, she removed to another mansion at Fossé, the home of Monsieur de Salaberry. She had addressed a letter to Napoleon, in which she presented her work to his notice, craved an interview in very respectful terms, and urged on his notice the advantage which it would be for her son's career and her daughter's eventual marriage, Albertine was then thirteen, if she were allowed to reside again in the neighborhood of Paris. While awaiting the answer to this, she gathered round her a group of her usual friends, among them Madame Recamier, Adrien and Mathieu de Montmorency, Prosper de Barante, and Benjamin Constant. This society amused itself with music, an Italian musician, Albertine's master, who played the guitar being of the company, and with a quaint invention named La Petite Puste. This consisted in abolishing conversation and substituting for it little notes, which were passed from one to the other. A very innocent amusement, but either it or the guitar playing or Corinne's famous name made some noise in the neighborhood. Finally, one evening Madame de Stal went to the theater at Blois, and on leaving it was surrounded by a curious crowd. Some officious person communicated this fact, probably with various others, some true, some false, to the minister of police, who wrote to the prefect of the department to complain that his master's celebrated foe was the center of a little court. In a short time the blow fell. No answer came from Napoleon, but instead of it the announcement that her book had been seized, that all copies of it were destroyed, and that the authoress was to leave France within three days either for America or Coppet. At the same time the prefect of Loire and Cher demanded the surrender of the manuscript of the work. Fortunately, Madame de Stal possessed a rough copy which she gave him while her son saved the real one. 
she wrote to Savary, Duke of Rovigo, permitted, she says bitingly, to hide his name under a title, and represented to him that the interval allowed her for her departure was insufficient. She received a reply which has become classic for its baseness, its insolence, and its ludicrous arrogance. All the littleness and none of the force of Napoleon was reflected from the mind of this underling. He told her that she need not seek for the cause of her exile in the silence regarding the emperor which she had observed in her work, for that no place in it could have been found worthy of him. For the rest, the heir of France did not suit her, and as for its inhabitants, they were not yet reduced to taking as models the nations whom she admired. Her last work was not French, and it was he, this worthy official, who had forbidden it to be printed. Savary thus claimed for himself, and not for his master, the glory of this precious proceeding, but as nobody suspected him of acting except under orders, he blew his trumpet to the desert air. The blow to Madame de Stal was a terrible one. Her first impulse was to go to America, but fearing the long sea voyage for her daughter at that season of the year, it was October, she once again set her face most reluctantly toward Coppet. This place, which she henceforward describes as a prison, was shortly afterwards made further distasteful to her by a change of prefect. Monsieur de Barante, who was a friend of hers, was removed, and the successor appointed to him, Monsieur Capel, was one of the functionaries now turned out by the gross from the imperial mould. He regarded Napoleon as a deity and himself as a prophet, and conceived the brilliant idea of distinguishing himself by persuading Madame de Stal to write something flattering of the emperor. Naturally he failed. The mind of a bureaucrat prostrate before the fetish of his own alarmed idolatry alone could have conceived the possibility of success. And naturally again his failure rankled and caused him to visit his disappointment on the creator of it by numerous small vexations. End of Section 17 Section 18 of Madame de Stal by Bella Duffy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami Chapter 12 Madame de Stal's Second Marriage, Part 1 Madame de Stal arrived at Coppet in a condition of despair, which she partially solaced by writing to Madame Recamier and thanking her again and again for the constancy of her friendship. Evidently, many of her friends had already dropped away, or she fancied they had. Perhaps she wearied them a little with her lamentations, for one knows that silence was never her forte. But all at once a happy change came over her. Sismondi, writing to the Countess of Albany, mentioned the transformation and spoke of their friend with admiration for her newborn, but to him, inexplicable courage. She had given up literary work and no longer alluded to her afflictions, and yet in spite of that her gaiety was great and her conversation was charming and sparkling as ever. Sismundi doubtless considered that reason, his beloved reason was at last asserting its sway over Corinne's excitable imagination. He must have been greatly surprised a long time afterwards when he learnt that the magician was love. Years previously, when Sismondi had himself been in love in his decorous fashion and had reproached Madame de Stal for want of sympathy in his trouble, a want which he had not expected in the author of Delphine, she said to him, I have never loved that I have not felt in myself two persons, one who laughed at the other. But when she made that answer, she was young and restless, and like all great and burning minds, claimed from life a destiny too radiant to be ever realized. Now she was middle-aged, she had drunk of the waters of bitterness, and known some of the tragic awakenings of passion, she had experienced in immeasurable sorrow and the loss of her father, 
she had become familiar in satiety with the triumphs of the world and was as she wrote to madame ricamier wearied of suffering in short the moment had come when the one imperious cry of the soul was for peace in such a state of mind what seems ridiculous becomes possible and the spirit of mocking youth in madame de stal which once could laugh at the passionate half of her nature was buried with most of her hopes and almost all of her illusions it was shortly after her return to switzerland that going to geneva to spend some little while she first met rocca he was twenty-three she was forty-five but that disparity of years did not prevent his conceiving for her a most romantic passion he was extremely handsome a fact to which alike frederica brun and byron alike bear witness and was further interesting through having been wounded in the war in spain and so badly that his health was never restored he was the son of a councillor of state in geneva and descended from a noble piedmontese family which had emigrated to switzerland during the persecution of the protestants he had some culture and considerable intelligence was even something of an author and finally was a splendid horseman he was wont to ride a magnificent black andalusian steed and performed unheard of feats of jumping and galloping under the windows of the house in geneva where madame de stal was staying these varied attractions finally proved irresistible to the object of his homage and before the year eighteen eleven a secret marriage took place why it was a secret is one of those mysteries which has never been satisfactorily cleared up one explanation is that bonaparte out of hatred of madame de stal would order rocca who was of course in the french army away on service but if this had been the real reason it was sufficiently strong to have rendered any further explanation unnecessary nevertheless a very good authority the authoress of cope et weimar gives two other reasons one that madame de stal would never have consented to give up the aristocratic name which she had made so illustrious the other that the world would have turned such a marriage into ridicule in this connection it is worth while to state that constant has given madame de stal's unwillingness to change her name as a reason why she would not consent to an open marriage with him the union with rocca seems to have been a very happy one but inasmuch as it passed for years in the eyes of everybody for a connection of another nature there is no doubt that it brought madame de stal into some discredit many of the guests at coppet admired rocca but sismondi for one disliked him extremely sismondi however was not infrequently disposed to be rather severe on madame de stal and her guests he even carped a little at the lovely juliette she madame Recamier, has put in a fleeting appearance here he wrote in august eighteen eleven she is full of kindness and graciousness toward madame de stal and is not less pretty than two years ago and yet i am glad that she is going for whenever she is present all true conversation is destroyed she always beguiles her neighbor into low-toned tete-a-tete talk her small airs and graces weary me and her intelligence for she is intelligent in no way profits the public sismondi sometimes visited madame de stal herself with criticism not less captious although he was generally vanquished in the end by her heroism and her charm during the summer of eighteen eleven she was in a very restless and unhappy mood which often drew forth his censure the conviction of the extreme disfavour with which napoleon regarded her was now widely spread and one of its results was a real or fancied falling off of friends which wounded her exceedingly to nothing was she so sensitive as to any failure of affection and the ardour with which she sought to defend herself from blame was caused not so much by offended self-love as by slighted feeling of a more amiable kind just about this time she wrote to camille jordan a very characteristic letter its tone was indignant for jordan always rather cold and repellent had evidently stung her by some censure of her conduct apparently also 
he had sought to justify himself for not coming to see her for she assured him that she had never dreamed of blaming him nor entertained a thought against his loyalty she quivered under a shaft which had struck more deeply home and in one sentence made an allusion applying apparently to rocca she owned that being placed as it appeared to her on the highest pinnacle of moral dignity she had felt some wonder at the fact that jordan indulgent toward the inconceivable conduct of girando should have reserved all his wrath for an unhappy woman who while resisting all attacks and defending her children and her talent at the risk of happiness security and life had allowed herself to be momentarily touched by the self-sacrificing chivalry of a young man her anger was but fleeting and a few months later she wrote as affectionately as ever to camille who perhaps for once had been shaken from his prudent calm by her fiery words and had calmed her by protesting unaltered regard this year of eighteen eleven was fruitful of sorrow mathieu de montmorency and madame de recamier were both exiled immediately after a visit paid by them to their illustrious friend according to madame lenormand the writer of copet et weimar as well as to madame de stal herself the letter from the minister of police which conveyed the order of exile to mathieu de montmorency distinctly signified that friendship with the mistress of copet was the cause of his disgrace sismondi however who showed himself incredulous and to a certain extent unsympathetic throughout all these circumstances when writing to the countess of albany was concerned to correct such an impression and declared that not only had the prefect of geneva and the minister of the french police disclaimed the idea as unfounded but he himself had never seen that anybody was in the least compromised by going to copet nevertheless in a very short time schlegel was ordered to quit the chateau on the preposterous plea that he had pronounced the phaedra of euripides to be superior to that of racine madame de stal went to aix for the sake of her youngest son's health but at the end of ten days was recalled by a letter from the prefect who advised her not to venture more than two leagues from copet very naturally she was irritated to the last degree and often deeply distressed at all these incidents the exile imposed on mathieu de montmorency and madame recamier caused her the greatest grief more especially as she never doubted but that unwittingly she was the cause she had other causes of suffering also in her health at the time and doubtless was far from being as brilliant as of yore circumstances she had a son by rocca in eighteen twelve condemned her to an isolation which fretted her almost beyond endurance and sismondi not possessing the key to the situation was aggrieved at her sombre mood and nervous irritability he wrote that he sometimes bores himself at copet o ichabod and he was induced to take refuge with sundry amiable persons at geneva who soothed his wounded self-love at last madame de stal inconsolable for the loss of schlegel's society panting to escape beyond the narrow limits of copet where her sons had no career before them and her daughter no chance of marrying and she herself was harassed by hints and admonitions from the prefect at every turn resolved upon escape she was informed through schlegel who was in bern at the time that if she would even now write something in praise of napoleon her fate would be considerably mitigated it is no slight credit to her that agitated and ill as she was she firmly declined nothing indeed at such a moment could have been more courageous than her refusal for she was torn with a thousand fears at her impending journey the passport would have been an insuperable difficulty as the permission to go to america once accorded had now been withdrawn from her entrance into italy was also denied and the government was determined that she should not take refuge in england yet to england she was resolved to go the only route open to her was through russia and sweden 
through her friend the grand duchess of weimar she obtained a passport which was to be handed to her in vienna all this took months to settle and it was only on the twenty third of may eighteen twelve that she was at last able to start it was necessary to leave in such a way as not to excite the attention of the lynx-eyed prefect of geneva the eve of her departure she wandered about the park of coppet a prey to the utmost grief she had been unwilling to return there at one time but now she was heartbroken at having to bid a long perhaps a last farewell to the tomb of her father and the scenes associated with his memory to her both by nature and system such a parting was particularly poignant at two o'clock on the afternoon of the twenty-third she got into her carriage announcing that she would return for dinner only two of her servants were in the secret albertine auguste and rocca were with her her second son was to follow in a few days and join her at vienna with her baggage for the present all the necessaries which the travellers absolutely needed were stowed away in the pockets of auguste and rocca madame de stal and albertine only carried fans the escape thus ingeniously planned was carried out with a success that it is quite pleasant to read of even to this moment the police never awoke at all to the fact of the flight until the luggage followed the fugitives and then madame de stal was beyond their reach history draws a veil over the feelings of the prefect end of section eighteen section nineteen of madame de stal by bella duffy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve madame de stal's second marriage part two at bern schlegel joined the party and auguste de stal separated from it in order to return to coppet to see after things there the travellers pushed on but because of madame de stal's health in no great haste through switzerland and the tyrol her one haunting fear all this time was that in bavaria an agent of the french government might have preceded her with an order for her arrest the abject subservience of the german governments at that time to napoleon made it very likely that in such a case passports would be so much waste paper vienna was reached in safety and there madame de stal at first determined to remain three weeks while a courier was dispatched to vilna to obtain the russian passport from the emperor alexander the first ten days of her sojourn were marked by cloudless pleasure security had returned to her and after her late repression varied chiefly by the prefect of geneva's solemn exhortations it was a real delight to find herself in the midst of a society where napoleon was frankly abused but the emperor and empress of austria were at dresden and the official mind left to itself soon became frightened at the idea of sheltering the dangerous authoress spies were stationed at her door and cropped up like poisonous fungi with silent rapidity along her path moreover an order had arrived for the arrest and return of rocca as a french officer the fact of his wounds and inability to serve being waived in the interests of persecution at this point one pauses to ask why after all madame de stal herself was not arrested there seems but little doubt that the obsequiousness of the austrian police would have been equal to the task perhaps napoleon shrank from the odium of such a proceeding perhaps he was in reality rather glad to be rid of madame de stal this would agree with a well-known conversation which he had held four years previously with auguste de stal who was going to him to plead for his mother's recall was told with insolent good-humoured contempt that the whole of europe except france was open to her that she would not be imprisoned as then she might have some cause to complain but that she alone could be unhappy when allowed to wander at will through every capital of europe except paris but if this explanation be accepted 
it becomes difficult to account for the later persecutions of madame de stael at the hands of the french and swiss police could it be that savary and his underlings through excess of zeal interpreted their instructions with liberal severity and that napoleon was not responsible for every individual act but only for the angry hatred which promised approval of each and all of them however this may be madame de stael's fears were not long in reasserting themselves too impatient to wait for the passport she started with her son and daughter for galicia having extracted from a friend the promise of hurrying after her as soon as the expected paper arrived in her memoir she admits that this was a mistake for at vienna she had friends to intercede in her favour while in galicia there was no shield between herself and the servility toward france of inferior officials as a consequence she was driven along her route by the unceasing admonitions to move on of the police her immediate goal was Landshut, the home of her friends prince and princess lubomirsky here she was to meet roca who had also proceeded on his way but disguised at some point of the road her passport reached her this was a ray of light and a letter from madame recamier which overtook her somewhere near olmutz was another but as a rule her sensations were all gloomy the discomforts of her journey through such a country and under such circumstances increased her sadness to which the finishing touch was put by the aspect of the desolated countries and of the overtaxed starving populations withering beneath the napoleonic blight and mingling curses on the oppressor with prayers to heaven for relief these tragic pictures were ludicrously but by no means reassuringly relieved by the sight of placards in the various towns where the passports had to be examined which ordained that madame de stael was to be submitted wherever she appeared to the surveillance of the police at Lansut, she had been informed that she was not to stay more than twenty-four hours this however was previous to her receiving the russian passport with that to show she hoped for more indulgence the hope was vain for at Lansut a police agent presented himself having received orders from his chief the governor of the district to see that madame de stal did not remain more than eight hours at the lubomirsky chateau and when she left he followed her carriage in a caleche thus causing her much alarm lest rocca on joining them should be recognized fifty leagues of austrian territory had still to be traversed the police agent who was described as carrying out his instructions with a most vexatious pertinacity quitted the travellers at the limit of his circle but madame de stal says that grenadiers were still found posted along the route to observe her and she did not breathe freely until she found herself on russian territory even there she could not allow herself to feel quite secure for napoleon's huge army destined for its apparent power and its oncoming doom to typify the falling might of france was hastening by forced marches to moscow and madame de stal to avoid meeting it had to reach st petersburg by a circuitous route her terror of being arrested and imprisoned still abode with her she was evidently convinced that the emperor was furious with her for having escaped his clutches and she began seriously to consider what she could do if any portion of the army threatened to overtake her her plan was to hasten on to odessa and thence proceed to greece and constantinople fortunately her companions succeeded in persuading her that she could travel by post much faster than an army and partially calmed she at last gave herself up to some enjoyment of the scenes and people around her her dix années d'exil always vivid becomes from this point a charming book she is a little too optimistic and indulges as usual too much in generalization but seizes on salient points with swiftness and describes them with remarkable force she was delighted with her reception by the nobles and the imperial family 
of the czar she speaks with a fervent admiration that later generations have not shared he had the facile amiability and conventional philanthropy of a sovereign who finds his benevolent theories so constantly crossed by circumstances as to release him in most instances from the responsibility of applying them but any promise of political reform and any appeal to general principles of excellence found so ready a response in madame de stal's own heart that especially where a monarch spoke she ceased to be severely critical according to galif she met in russia with immense social success and enchanted everybody he personally found her much improved since the days of her brilliant but too self-assertive youth stein was struck with her air of simplicity and goodness and sought to convey her great unaffectedness of manner by saying that she gives herself no trouble to please quite a man's judgment on a woman and curiously inaccurate as a necessary consequence madame de stal was so intensely interested in every new person who appeared to her at all distinguished that she must always have cared supremely to please but what stein probably meant was that she had none of the airs and graces of worldly coquettes and very often when launched in conversation she must have been more bent on convincing than seducing madame de stal passes over in her memoirs a scene at the theatre during her visit to st petersburg which wounded her deeply and is related by arndt she went with her son and somebody else to the theatre francais to see racine's phedre scarcely was she seated when somebody in the pit denounced her and her companions as french instantly the people rose and clamoured for them to be turned out the performance was stopped the actors decamped and poor madame de stal sobbing with indignation and grief was led away even then she felt the insult chiefly as levelled at racine and repeated incessantly oh les barbares les barbares oh mon racine arndt was rather astonished at her taking such a scene so much to heart but on reflection arrived at the conclusion that german women might be the better for a little of the same passionate patriotism but unpleasant incidents during her stay in the russian capital seem to have been few she visited several institutions was received everywhere with politeness and cordiality and revelled again as she had done in vienna in listening to the free expression of sentiments that agreed with her own events however were progressing rapidly and in spite of the engagement never to sign a peace entered into by the czar with bernadotte at abo the battle of borodino and the taking of moscow filled most people with dismay madame de stal always easily alarmed thought that the moment had arrived when she could no longer remain in russia with safety and she set her face towards sweden en route for england thus quitting st petersburg a few days too soon to receive in all its force the electric shock of learning that moscow was fired at abo where she was to embark for stockholm she met bernadotte now prince royal of sweden whom she had formerly known in paris as an habitue of her own and madame recamier's salon of course he admired the lovely juliette and hastened to inquire after her with an interest which madame de stal straightway conveyed in a letter to her friend a letter worded however with a caution that reveals the inconceivable difficulty even of private correspondence in those stormy days at stockholm she was welcomed according to her son with perfect kindness and as she was notoriously enthusiastic about bernadotte whom she unhesitatingly announced to be the hero of the age it is probable that he honoured her with a great deal of his confidence galif author of don siècle de l'autre who had access to her correspondence from sweden with j a galif in st petersburg was of opinion that her influence had a large share in determining bernadotte to declare himself against bonaparte she dedicated her reflexions sur le suicide to the prince in a very complimentary preface 
in which she compared herself and her children as seeking his protection in the same way as arabian shepherds take shelter from a storm under a laurel and went on to assure him that his public life had been signalized by all the virtues which claim the admiration of thinkers and she encouraged him to persevere and remind the world of that which it has entirely forgotten namely that the highest reason teaches virtue in contrast to all this praise it is piquant to learn that bernadotte like so many other practically minded people had his little grumble at his illustrious guest and talked of the inconceivable preoccupation with self which at this time had led madame de stal to see in every political move of napoleon the beginning of some new measure against herself her oft-professed anxiety about her son's future was allayed by the prince royal's offer to interest himself in auguste's diplomatic career while albert was to enter the swedish army one might wonder why this obvious solution to her difficulties had not presented itself sooner to madame de stal were it not evident that she had consciously or unconsciously made the most of every circumstance which could heighten the apparent hardship of her lot End of section nineteen Section twenty of Madame de Stal by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter thirteen. England again. Part one. After quitting Sweden, Madame de Stal went to England. Some eighteen years or so had passed since she had wept in the lanes at Mickleham at the thought of separating from the charming colony at Juniper Hall her heart was still almost as young as in those days the vivid flame of enthusiasm for all that was good still burnt as brightly in her soul if her spiritual horizon had widened and a fervent if rather vague religious sentiment had succeeded to her unquestioning faith in men that was almost all the change in her for her nature was a singularly homogeneous one and growth while widening and deepening it did not render it more complex her reception in english society was marked by all the enthusiasm which we are accustomed to lavish on illustrious foreigners she was mobbed at routs and assemblies and ladies mounted on chairs and tables to stare at her she took up her abode at thirty argyle place regent street a house now a bathing establishment it was here that she received the mixed but brilliant society which byron declared reminded him of the grave inasmuch as all distinctions were levelled in it these social meetings formed her protest against the enormous and overcrowded gatherings which were dignified then as now with the name of society in london and where madame de stal found that all intellectual enjoyment was smothered by sheer force of numbers she was willing enough to admit that clever men and women in england were transcendentally interesting when caught in sufficiently small groups to make rational conversation possible but declared that all qualities of mind were annihilated in the crowds where the only superiority necessary was physical force to enable one to elbow one's way along byron and madame de stal became very good friends although she rated him about his conduct in love and he laughed with quiet malice at many of her peculiarities one of his favourite diversions or at least so he said was to plague her by declaring that he did not believe in napoleon's persecutions nothing made her more angry he declared inasmuch as she was proud of the danger which as she believed threatened napoleon's government from her eloquence and fame byron in his conversations with lady blessington told one or two stories of corinne more diverting probably than veracious and complained of her overwhelming declamation as distinguished from talk her tendency to metaphysical subtleties her extraordinary self-complacency 
and the strange simplicity which caused her to be perpetually mystified but he admitted that she was a fine creature with great talent and many noble qualities and he loudly proclaimed her immeasurable superiority to every woman with pretensions to literary fame in england he even found several things to admire in her appearance which in a man of his taste was a very precious testimony and might have consoled madame de stal had she only known about it for those personal defects which were said to afflict her the person who in all england appears to have been the best match conversationally for madame de stal was sir james mackintosh who perhaps gave the best of all descriptions of her when he said she is one of the few persons who surpass expectation she has every sort of talent and would be universally popular if in society she were to confine herself to her inferior talents pleasantry anecdote and literature which are so much more suited to conversation than her eloquence and genius at another time he remarked her penetration was certainly extraordinary with an air of apparent occupation in things immediately around her he recorded not always approvingly some of her sweeping judgments as for instance that political economy was prosaic and uninteresting and that miss austen's novels are commonplace her stay in england was saddened although apparently not very deeply by the violent death of her younger son byron's flippant allusion to this tragic event has brought him into much disrepute madame de stal he wrote has lost one of her young barons who has been carbonated by a vile teutonic adjutant corinne is of course what all mothers must be but will i venture to prophesy do what few mothers could write an essay upon it she cannot exist without a grievance and somebody to see or read how much grief becomes her all these epigrammatic previsions turned out to be apparently unfounded for there is no proof that madame de stal mourned her son with anything approaching to the passion with which she had grieved for her father sismondi indeed always censorious is rather severe on what he is pleased to consider her want of maternal feeling and as she was never known to hide her sentiments it is only fair to conclude that comparative silence meant comparative insensibility albert de stal was very high-spirited and impetuous and rather wild judging from a severe and somewhat self-righteous epistle addressed to him on one occasion by his mother he had many of the faults that irritated and none of the qualities that pleased her auguste and albertine inspired by their adoring veneration presumably tried to mould their tastes and pursuits by hers but albert appears to have been different for his mother reproaches him with remaining unmoved by her own intellect the dignity of his brother the charm of his sister and the talents of m schlegel she assures him that he is unfit to appreciate the mother whom he possesses and very characteristically requests to be told of what service it has been to him to be the grandson of necker neither the invocation of this august memory nor the general drift of the arguments strike one as happily chosen for moving a thoughtless lad in his teens who was probably drawn towards his brother and sister by other reasons than their respective dignity and charm and was more than likely to be secretly bored by the disquisitions of the learned schlegel however this may be the letter gives the full measure of the contempt which madame de stal could feel for folly and frivolity and if those were the distinguishing characteristics of albert it is very comprehensible that the first pangs of natural grief overcome his loss would not leave a great void in her active existence in the autumn of eighteen thirteen la lemagne was published it appeared in london and straightway caused the greatest ferment known for a long while in the literary world 
the circumstances under which it saw the light, the social position, sex, and history of its author, and its own intrinsic merits combined to make it an event. It is notorious how much Sir James Mackintosh and Byron admired it, and articles concerning it, critical and laudatory, poured from the European press. Goethe admitted that no previous writer had so largely revealed the riches of German literature to the intelligence of an unappreciative generation, and although the great Teutonic race was not fully satisfied with the work at the time, and has since become somewhat captious regarding it, the talent which it displayed has never been called in question. By a sufficiently striking coincidence, the publication of L'Allemagne took place in the same month as the Battle of Leipzig. Only a brief period then elapsed before Napoleon abdicated, and Madame de Stal, her splendid and triumphant exile terminated, was enabled once more to re-enter the gates of beloved but alas humiliated paris she was far too patriotic not to entertain saddened feelings on seeing the streets of the capital filled with soldiers in german russian and cossack uniforms for while rejoicing in the overthrow of napoleon she mourned the tarnished glory of the french arms she was received with the utmost cordiality by louis the eighteenth and her salon quickly became the rallying ground for all the brightest intellects of france it is interesting to read that talleyrand the supple silent time-serving talleyrand was among her guests she forgave him of course for his long oblivion of her old claims on his friendship but not more thoroughly in all probability than he forgave himself to paris had returned the abbe de montesquion lally tolendal lafayette how changed were the times since the latter had hurried thither to plead and plead in vain for his imprisoned king since the abbe had waited in disguise on the high road for madame de stal to arrive in her carriage and convey him out of france since lally the fattest of susceptible men, had brought his eloquence and sensibility to help in enlivening the sylvan glades of Michelum. Madame Recamier had returned, and Constant, at the ripe age of forty-eight and married for the second time, was so in love with her as to resent any allusion to the past which could divert him even momentarily from his all-absorbing passion madame de crudiner worn and wasted with sibylline fervour had commenced her religious gatherings and the czar was drawn daily within the circle of her spells while madame recamier was banished from it because her beauty could still claim glances that were vowed to heaven constant going once never went again perhaps because juliette was wanting perhaps because such mystic utterances as fell from the inspired priestess's lips were too vague to find an echo in his passion-tossed soul. To Paris also had come Bonstetin, younger than ever in spirit and hopeful for all his burden of years. End of section 20《21》of Madame de Stael by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13. England Again. Part 2. The dawn of the new era, so quickly clouded for more serious and prescient souls than his, filled him with delight. He was brighter and more contented now than he had been in youth. The world seemed a better place to him, and he almost wondered how anybody could be sad in a universe so full of new ideas and dazzling intellectual possibilities. Besides all these interesting figures, other and more splendid, if not more illustrious, personages crowded Madame de Stal's salon. Thither came the Tsar, so chivalrous and sympathetic in these days thither came her old friend the duke of saxe weimar 
and Wellington presented himself to be received with the utmost cordiality and to inscribe himself on the long list of Madame Recamier's admirers. At first, Madame de Stael's heart beat high with patriotic hopes. She had become monarchical in her feelings again and expected great things for France from the liberal disposition of the king. She exerted herself quite in her old way to talk over dissidents and reconcile malcontents, for her one longing was that the new constitution of France might be made on the pattern and informed with the spirit of England. But she was not slow to discover how ill-founded were such aspirations. Egotism stalked through the exhausted land. Egotism under various forms and professing various creeds, now wearing the superannuated uniform of the Maison Rouge, now decorated with the medals conferred by Napoleon, now prating of old services before the emigration, now professing a servile repentance for base obedience to Bonaparte. They were but differences in the mask, after all. Yet over these differences men wrangled, and meanwhile the poison of a deadly indifference crept through the veins of France. Madame de Stael saw all this and felt it with a passionate regret. In the last volume of her Considération, she shows how everything was accorded in the letter only to be constantly violated in the spirit. She deplored the irreconcilable folly of the émigré, the abject cringing of converted Bonapartists, who only cared for power, and the disastrous reactionary influences which hampered the action of the court. She returned for the summer to Coppet, a very welcome refuge to her now that she went thither of her own free will. Her health was beginning to fail about this time, while that of Monsieur Roca gave her constant anxiety. Originally she had been blessed, if not with a splendid constitution, at least with a royal disdain of physical influences. She had felt neither heat nor cold, and spoke even with a certain impatience of invalid considerations. But she had lived at such high pressure intellectually from her very earliest years, had thought, felt, talked, and done so much, that her existence could not be counted like most people's by years. In the sense of accumulated efforts and results, it had been a very long life, and the expenditure of nervous energy so constantly kept up was beginning to tell at last. Even Bonstetin, the optimist, saw a change in her when, in July 1814, he visited her at Coppe. She was indeed very depressed in spirits, but he appeared to allude only to a physical alteration for he declared her to be as brilliant and good as ever. He might have added as indefatigable. She found somebody to translate Wilberforce's work on the slave trade and wrote a preface to the French edition. Also she published in pamphlet form an appeal for abolition addressed to the sovereigns met together at that time in Paris, and she was busy with her work Consideration of which the first two parts alone were eventually revised by herself. In July, from Coppe, she wrote a characteristic letter to Madame Recamier, telling what difficulty she experienced in keeping up the fine love of solitude which had beguiled her momentarily into seeking that picturesque and sacred but monotonous retreat. My soul is not sufficiently rural, she writes, I regret your little apartment and our quarrels and conversations and all that life which is yours. In this sturdy love of streets, Madame de Stal resembled Dr. Johnson, and perhaps if the truth were known, she resembled all good talkers. She returned to Paris in the winter of 1814-15, conscious that her strength was failing. She became extremely anxious to marry her darling daughter to some man who would be worthy of her. Her circumstances had been recently much improved, 
by the repayment from the treasury of the two millions which necker had left there such wealth joined to her own brilliant social position entitled her to look out for a good parti for albertine but she was resolute that the match should be a happy one her ideal of felicity was conjugal love she preached indeed a code of wifely submission that would seem very insipid to some emancipated damsels in our days and was perhaps a little too perfect to be possible but she put into it all her own rare faith in good and often laughingly declared that she would force her daughter to make a marriage of the heart in the midst of these amiable preoccupations and while enjoying once again the delight of social intercourse unhampered by foreign modes of speech and thought and untroubled by the irritation of exile madame de stal was still haunted by a foreboding of evil such presentiments were very common with her she had the quick indefinable instinct of imaginative minds and felt that subtle vibration of events which precedes or perhaps causes change in them probably she hardly knew what she anticipated and yet when the news of napoleon's escape from elba arrived it seemed as if the expected disaster could only be that an hour after she met m de la valette and said to him if bonaparte triumph liberty is lost and if he be beaten our national independence is over a few days of utter consternation followed a pause of bewildered incapable silence through which as chateaubriand so graphically says the sound of bonaparte's advancing footsteps echoed then came the news of one town and province after another rallying round the standard of the resurgent conqueror ney departed vowing to bring back his former master in an iron cage and the vain boast so quickly yet not ludicrously disproved inspired as little confidence as it deserved the court prepared for ignominious flight and madame de stal had no choice but to follow its example but a few months previously she had by chance become aware of a conspiracy against napoleon's life and for all her hatred of him had been so moved by the menace of peril to her ancient and implacable foe that she had found means to dispatch a warning to him yet now when she heard of his return all her terror of him revived in its pristine force bringing back with it the flood of agitated imagination which had so long poisoned her life villemain has left a record of the evening of the eighteenth of march eighteen fifteen which he passed in the salon of the countess rumford and where he met madame de stal several famous and to us now familiar personages were present lafayette constant jeancourt cuvier sismondi and le mercier among others every moment somebody arrived with news of the advancing hero madame de stal came late and instantly attracted the general attention to herself she was overwhelmed with sadness but more for france even than for herself she had been at the tuileries and found that there all hope of resistance was abandoned her own mind was made up for flight yet she urged madame de rumford to remain showing that she considered napoleon's hatred of herself to be inextinguishable and active as ever in point of fact napoleon's earliest care on reaching the capital was to express his regret at her departure it is very unlikely that he would have molested her in any way had she remained but it was ordained that to the last he should make her suffer even more in imagination than in reality she urged madame recamier to escape with her for juliette's prescription never having been formally revoked madame de stal considered her danger as great as her own but madame recamier more calm refused with her remained benjamin constant although he also was admonished by madame de stal to seek safety in another land his career during the hundred days is well known he began by attacking napoleon violently then had an interview with him was fascinated converted appointed a councillor of state 
and helped to edit the Acte Additionnel. Another convert was the sober-minded Sismondi, and several people have asserted on the authority first of an English editor, then of Monsieur Thiers, that the great, the irreconcilable, Corinne herself gave in a tardy but complete adhesion. Saint Beuve endorsed the error and based his belief upon the style of an unsigned note in French found among Lord Castlereagh's posthumous papers and attributed by Lord Londonderry's secretary to Madame de Stael. This letter was supposed to have been written at Coppe and forwarded to Mr. Crawford, the American minister in Paris, in order that he might take it to London. Its object was to inspire English statesmen with the writer's own belief in Napoleon's newfound sincerity and to recommend his government to their support. A comparison of dates shows, however, that such a letter, if dispatched from Coppe, could only have reached Paris twenty-four hours after Mr. Crawford's departure, and Thiers' assumption that Madame de Stael remained in Paris during the hundred days is disproved by her correspondence from Switzerland with Madame Recamier. Finally, and again according to Thiers, Sismondi's conversion was a result of Madame de Stael's own change of views. But this also appears quite untenable, inasmuch as Sismondi himself bears testimony to her resentment against Napoleon, strengthened, as he says, to a blind and violent hatred. This is the natural language of a person who has veered, about another person who has not, and the expression occurs in a letter of Sismondi's written from Coppe a short time after Waterloo, and when he had gone to the chateau, in some doubt as to the nature of the reception there awaiting him. He had been much relieved to find his hostess as cordial as ever. Madame de Stal indeed never seems to have willingly or spontaneously given up any friend whom she had once admitted to the title. Politics are apt to envenom the most intimate relations, but they left no bitterness in her great and gentle soul. Alas, the happy days at Coppe were numbered now, for most of those whom we have seen congregating there through so many exciting summers. Madame de Stal delighted in the exercise of a generous hospitality. Nobody ever seems to have managed her business affairs better than she did, and among the few apparent contradictions of her transparent nature was the spirit of order in which she dealt with life as soon as the things presented to her consideration were hard facts and not sentiments. In all administrative matters she had the capacity of a true Frenchwoman, and while systematic and careful, was the least avaricious of women. End of section 21《Section 22 of Madame de Stal by Bella Duffy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14 Closing Scenes. After Waterloo, Madame de Stal did not return to France. The thought of the second occupation by foreign troops was odious to her, and besides this, she feared the outbreak of reactionary feelings and foresaw a political condition in which her pure and ideal liberalism would be equally unwelcome to all parties. Roca's state of health finally induced her to go to Italy. From Milan she sent a letter to Madame Recamier, which is interesting as showing how little her fine mind and noble heart were in harmony just then with the conditions of affairs in France. "'You are kind enough to say to me,' she wrote, that I should do better to be in Paris, but no, indeed, I should not care to see some forms of liberty, franchise, accorded to the people, for it is my creed that nations are born free. I should say unfashionable things and make enemies unnecessarily. When all is arranged for Albertine's marriage, I shall lead a solitary life in Paris, but at present I do well, believe me, to have myself represented by Auguste. Like you, I think well and better than ever of Victor de Broglie, and I shall be very glad of the marriage if nothing goes against it. I am also of your way of thinking in regard to Madame de Crudinaire, 
she is the herald of a great oncoming religious epoch speak of me to her i beg as of a person quite devoted to her monsieur roca's health still gives me anxiety i have never recovered any happiness since bonaparte disembarked madame de stal had been very happy in her marriage with roca and the tenderness with which she regarded him was manifest to all her acquaintances under such circumstances it does seem strange that she should to the last have kept her marriage with him a secret the most plausible reason for such a course fear of napoleon's spite existed no longer after waterloo why then have gratuitously incurred the reproach of an illicit connection why above all separate herself for five years from her own and roca's child such conduct does not on the face of it seem quite consistent with the lofty ideal of duty which madame de stal professed albertine's wedding took place in civil form at leghorn on february fifteenth eighteen fifteen and five days later in pisa a double religious ceremony one catholic the other protestant was performed all madame de stal's friends gave a charming picture of albertine guizot lamartine and bonstetin were most enthusiastic about her their praises were also echoed by byron who needless to say was no mean judge and tickner seeing her in paris about a year after her marriage never mentioned her except in terms of admiration she was both beautiful and clever and after her mother's death became in her turn the queen of a cosmopolitan salon accompanied by the bride and bridegroom by roca by schlegel and sismondi madame de stal presently betook herself to florence and while there renewed her acquaintance with the countess of albany alfieri was dead now and fabre reigned in his stead madame de stal appears to have adopted him with the mingled enthusiasm and indulgence which she exhibited toward all tastes of her friends the summer of eighteen sixteen was spent in cope the newest and most interesting figure there on this occasion was byron he had shaken the dust of england from his feet and was nursing his lyrical cynicism at cologny near geneva unfortunately his reputation was so bad that the virtuous society of the place would not know him madame de stal alone not only received but welcomed him he was grateful and so far yielded to the influence which this gratitude enabled her to exercise over him as actually to make an imperfect attempt at reconciliation with his wife in order to please his eloquent and magnanimous hostess it is amusing to note the different impressions which byron the charming reprehensible byron made upon the various guests at the chateau bonstetin as might be expected was quite fascinated by him and wrote to maltason of his musical voice and beautiful head and of the half honest little demon that darted in a lambent way through the sarcasm of his speech sismondi the correct and censorious dwells more especially on byron's cynical contempt for appearances and the conduct and companionship which had brought him into disrepute with the worthy genovese cope had never been quite as brilliant probably as in this last summer that madame de stal was to reign there the society was more varied in nationality than in the days when a brilliant but small band of intellects had gathered round to console her in her exile brougham bell lady hamilton lord breadalbin romilly stendhal schlegel passed in rapid succession over the scene talked sparkled and disappeared they flashed like meteors but madame de stal shone among them with a steady splendour wherever and with whomsoever she was her powers remained always unquenchable nevertheless a great sadness possessed her this was partly due to her anxiety concerning roca partly to the disappointment inevitable in a spirit which broke impatiently against the limitations of life the pettiness of human nature ah happiness she exclaimed yearningly then added but at my age no trust is possible but in the goodness of god 
Bonstetin, parting with her, was struck with the profound melancholy of the glance which she gave him. He had been gay and content as usual, yet the memory of her look dwelt with him, and unable to explain it, he at last, the dear genial old man, arrived at the touching conclusion that she had been thinking of how old he was, and that she would never see him again. The adieu was indeed a lasting one, but it was over Madame de Stael's radiant path that the shadows of death were to gather first. Nevertheless, during the winter of 1816 and 17, and when she returned to Paris, her spirit showed no sign of failing. In her salon gathered Chateaubriand, Tolerant, Wellington, Humboldt, Blücher, Lafayette, Schlegel, and his brother Canova, and crowds of English. Bonstetin averred that to her influence over Wellington alone was due the fact that the army of occupation was about this time diminished by 30,000 men. Just before her death, she removed from the Rue Royale to the Rue Neuve de Materin, and it was here that Chateaubriand again, after so many years, saw Madame Recamier, and commenced the romantic friendship which was to end only with his death. He had been invited to dine at Madame de Stal's, but when he arrived there, found that she was too ill to entertain the guests. The dinner took place all the same, for Madame de Stal invariably insisted on this, and made her daughter do the honours. They must have been melancholy banquets, the little Duchess de Broglie presiding with a heavy heart, and all the guests being vividly conscious of the noble life slowly and painfully ebbing away in another room. It is with a certain relief, therefore, in the midst of so much sadness, that one reads Chateaubriand's record of his meeting with Juliette. He was selfish and self-conscious and weak, no doubt. His fretful, uneasy vanity, indeed, pierces through the affected melancholy of the Mémoire d'Outre-Tombe. They are sickly with a kind of faded perfume, and yet, in the great void which is coming, one is glad to think that the blind Madame Recamier, the aged and feeble Chateaubriand, must often have remembered perchance, often talked of, that dinner where they met in the house of their dying friend. Her interest in life remained undiminished to the last. Not only Chateaubriand, but Constant, Mathieu de Montmorency, Sismondi, all her old friends were daily with her. She was even glad to welcome strangers, although frequently so ill that her physicians forbade such visits for several days at a time. It was after one of these intervals that Ticknor saw her. She received him in bed, and her weakness was already so great that she could barely stretch out her hand to touch his. She alluded to her approaching end with a calmness infinitely pathetic and admirable in one who suffered none of that slow extinction of the faculties which blunts the anguish of the end for so many departing souls. Seeing that her words pained her daughter, she changed the subject to America and spoke of the great future of that country with characteristic enthusiasm of belief. Of Europe, Tickner said, she despaired. She might well do so, for the era then beginning was one with which she could not have sympathized. Whatever its virtues, its force, its promise, the oracles by which it was inspired must have sounded strange in her ears. Herself she had been a kind of priestess. Through her some unknown god had spoken, and amid the thunder of great events her faith for all its ideal grandeur had hardly seemed too mighty but that age had passed, and it was fit she should pass with it. All witnesses except the captious Sismondi bear testimony to the devotion with which Rocca nursed his wife in her last illness. Silent, pallid, sad as a phantom itself, he sat day by day beside her bed. According to Madame d'Abrante, she never looked long at him without feeling that she might still live. The sense that her existence was necessary to him seemed to inspire her for a moment with the courage to take up anew the increasing burden of her days. 
but at other times her thoughts turned with a grateful sense of coming rest to the great change and to the thought of her father waiting for her as she said on the other shore constant passed the last night of her life by her bedside she had seemed so much better that at eleven o'clock mathieu de montmorency left convinced that in the morning he would find her revived she suffered no pain during the concluding hours and the brightness of her intellect was not even momentarily dimmed sleep visited her as usual then at five o'clock she opened her eyes again for the last time on the world a few moments later she passed away so quietly that her watchers did not note the precise moment in which her great soul was exhaled the date of her death was the fourteenth of july eighteen seventeen the news of it was the signal for perhaps the most widely spread and most genuine outburst of grief ever known joubert indeed asserts the contrary and not only declares that she was not regretted but adds that constant meeting him casually the very day after the event did not even allude to it it never seems to have occurred to joubert that constant might have had some other and deeper cause for silence than indifference from such a nature reserve was perhaps the only tribute that could be more eloquently expressive than the loud lamentations of other friends these abounded and even chateaubriand who after all had not been bound to the dead woman by such ties of constant friendship as attached schlegel sismondi and others even he records with a sort of jealous care that in the last letter she ever wrote to madame de duras a letter penned in large irregular characters like a child's there was an affectionate allusion to francis bonstetin and sismondi have both left records of their grief at her funeral the latter writing immediately after it to his mother said my life is painfully changed I owe more to her than to any other person. Bonstetin's sorrow finds a more energetic expression. I miss her as though she were a part of myself. I am maimed henceforward in thought. She was buried at Coppet, and they laid her coffin at the foot of her father's. A crowd of friends, of humble mourners, and of official functionaries assembled to do her homage, but Rocca was too ill to be present. He died, indeed, only seven months later, and the son whom Madame de Stal had borne him hardly reached early manhood before he also passed away. Auguste de Stal had preceded him along the road to eternity, and the Duchess de Broglie did not live to be old. Twenty years had hardly elapsed before, with the sole exception of her faithful friend and cousin, Madame Necker de Saussure, no near relative of madame de stal was still alive but those who had known her did not need to be reminded of her she was constantly present to them a radiant imperishable vision i wish i could see you asleep bonstetin had said one day to her i would like to feel sure that you sometimes close your eyes and are not always thinking she had remained so bright and full of life to the last that even death's inexorable hand could not for many long years efface the recollection of her vivid personality in a page of the memoire d'outre-tombe chateaubriand has left a description of a visit paid by himself and madame recamier to the grave at coppet it was fifteen years after madame de stal's death the chateau was closed the apartments deserted juliette wandering through them recognized one after another the spots where madame de stal had played the piano had talked to those gathered round her or had written the two friends went into the park where the autumn leaves already were reddening and falling the wind subsided by degrees and the sound of a mill stream alone broke the stillness madame recamier entered the wood into whose depths the grave is hidden while chateaubriand remained looking at the snowy line of the alps and at the glittering lake above the sombre heights of jura the sky was covered with golden clouds like a glory spreading above a bier suddenly madame recamier pale and tearful phantom-like among phantoms emerged from the wood 
and on her companion's melancholy spirit fell a sense of all the emptiness of glory of all the sad reality of life qu'est-ce que la gloire asked madame de stal ce n'est qu'un deuil éclatant du bonheur we could wish that the most famous of women might have held a less hopeless creed End of section 22